what's up? What's going on, everybody? Hang on one second. Uh, there I am. Well, hello, everybody. Merry Christmas, everybody. All right, Merry Christmas. Do me a favor. Turn to your neighbor and say Merry Christmas. Turn to your other neighbor and say Merry Christmas. All right. This is awesome. All right, y'all. I, I hope y'all have done your homework from last week, okay, because we are in this series called A Gospel According to Scrooge. And really, uh, what we're trying to do is, 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 is look at the life of uh, this man named Ebenezer Scrooge, okay? Now, the Muppet Christmas Carol, how many of y'all know that's, that is a superior Christmas Carol, all right? What's better than Muppet Christmas Carol? What is better than the Muppet Christmas Carol? The Jim Carrey one? No, he's got the dead Polar Express eyes in that movie. I don't like it. It's creepy. Anyways, um, uh, so last week we talked about Scrooge's love of money and how God is calling us to be givers. And, and next week, y'all will have the opportunity to give in our happy birthday Jesus offering next week at Middletown Campus, okay? So you want to be there. It's going to be awesome. There's going to be cookies. We're going to have perhaps maybe snow even um, and a surprise guest if we found him. Yeah, Brad, we're working on this. Okay, we're, so Santa will be there. So it's going to be epic. For sure. But the whole purpose of this series is to teach you how not to be a Scrooge-like person. Because in the beginning of the story, Scrooge, he treated people poorly. He was in a sour mood all the time. And he walked around always saying this, ba, what, ba, ba humbug, exactly. And his attitude led to a joyless life. And, and, and hear me tonight, y'all. Christmas without joy is pointless. Really, if you think about it, life, life without joy is pointless. Why? Because you are missing something. It's kind of like that feeling you have when you bite into a sugar-free cookie, right? Something's missing. No one bring those, okay, next week at our, at our thing. No one bring sugar-free cookies, all right? But let's do this. Psalm 16, 8 through 11 talks about joy and where our joy should come from. So Psalm chapter 16, verse 8 through 11. Lucas, I'm so sorry I didn't bring my Bible so you could borrow it. Forgive me. Next, next week, though, okay? We got you, all right? Psalm 16, 18 through 11 says this. I have set the Lord always before me because he, has, he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you, you God, will not abandon my soul to shoal or let your Holy One see corruption. Verse 11, I love this. For you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of what? Fullness of Joy, fullness of joy at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. What, do, what can we take from this verse is this. God is the source of pure joy. And one of the reasons why Jesus left heaven and came down to earth is to give us a joyful life. Amen? Notice I didn't say an easy life. No, but a joyful life. And going back to the story of Scrooge, it took Scrooge um, exploring his past, his present, and future for him to turn his life around from joylessness to an abundance of joy. And tonight we will do the same. Big question here tonight. Are you living a bah humbug life? In other words, are you living a joyless life? Um, and if that's you in here, God wants something different for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you that you can be the true source of joy, Jesus. God, in this season that we are in, God, may we always remember the true reason for this season. That is, of course, your birth of your son, Jesus. We love you. God bless these students here. God bless these students at our campuses and those watching online. We love you. And if you're with me, let me hear you say amen. 
Amen, good stuff. So how do you live a joyful life? A lot of people wonder this. Our first point here tonight, a joyful life surrenders the past to God. A joyful life surrenders the past to God. Listen, and this is gonna, should give you some good news, y'all. Your past does not define who you are. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. Your past does not define who we are. The problem is so many of us have a hard time moving on from the past. I remember this was a big thing for me in high school. I, would, I, I, was, I was that kid who would just stay up. Like I would go to bed and I would just lay, lay awake in bed. And just think about the things that have happened that day or even from years past. And just the past would just be circulating through my mind. Does that happen to anybody else sometimes? Like, you know, when you think about the past? Or, 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 maybe, or maybe you were triggered by a situation that brings up bad memories. And so what happens there is the past ends up affecting our present way more than it should. So going back to the story of Scrooge, in the story, he is visited by three ghosts, actually technically four ghosts, right? Because the, the first is a little like a business partner kind of pops up in that story first. Um, but the first ghost that really kind of like showed him his, the error of his ways was the ghost of Christmas past, okay? And again, represented here by the superior Christmas Carol, a.k.a. the Muppets Christmas Carol, all right? Good man, Lucas. Good man. And in this in this movie, in this movie, Scrooge, he is reminded of his past, the mistakes of his past, the situations that he let define him, even to the point of choosing wealth over love. And he had to deal with his past before he could actually change. And y'all like. Let's be honest, Christmas can be a joyful time. It can be a fun time. But how do y'all know that Christmas can also be a hard time, a difficult time? And I think I know why. I try to, like, think about it. It's like, oh, what, 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 what is it about the Christmas season, you know, that has drug me down in the past at least? And, you know, really, if you think about it, all of your family gets together and, and, and maybe, like, your aunts and your uncles who you haven't seen for like a long, 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 long time, they show up and they come and celebrate Christmas. And then those relatives, they tend to, they tend to remember and treat you uh, like the younger person you used to be rather than the teenager that you are, okay? Um, and most of the time, it's completely harmless, you know, when my mom shows up to the house for Christmas, she still calls me her little baby boy, all right? And she asks me to shave my beard because little baby boys don't have beards. And I have to remind my mom, Mom, I'm a man. You know, it's like being like, I'm not this little boy. And, th and that's cute, whatever. But sometimes it can be painful. Sometimes in this season, you can be reminded about the embarrassing stories that you have. Maybe your relatives bring up that time that you wet the bed or something or that you cried at some Christmas play. And maybe sometimes you may be reminded about past mistakes or, or maybe someone else's mistake that still affects you and haunts you. I know that might be only a handful of people in this room, but if that's you, let me encourage you with this scripture. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 18. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And what is reconciliation, at least in the context that we're talking about? Reconciliation is simply bringing a resolution between your past and your present. Basically, in, in other words, this, um, learning from your past but not being controlled by your past. Learn from your past but not being controlled by your past. And you do this. Like, how in the world do you do this? You do this 
by surrendering your past to God, by simply going to him in prayer and tell, tell God, God, this is what's troubling me. God, I'm still thinking about this issue. And it's asking God what you should learn from that situation and then trusting God that he can somehow make this, make this past of yours Take, take it from something bad but, and use it for good, even to benefit others. Um, how many of y'all have ever heard the phrase forgive and forget? You guys have heard that? Okay. Um, that is the dumbest phrase I have ever heard in my entire life. And we should not be teaching children this. I remember growing up, I always used to hear that. Oh, forgive and forget, forgive and forget. Um, but forgiveness has nothing to do with forgetfulness. You see, when we choose to forget, we are forfeiting any lessons that we can learn from our past. And if we don't learn from our past, then the past, this makes the past repeatable in our present. Same people will hurt us. Yes, forgive people, but set boundaries. If someone was constantly hurting me, yes, I would forgive them, but I would start putting some boundaries between me and that, and that person, right? And forgetting also erases God's glory and his deliverance. Because, y'all, instead, instead of saying, oh, I'm this way because of my past. I, I'm this way. I speak this way. I act this way because of my past. You can now say, through the power of Jesus Christ, wow, look what the Lord has done. Man, I was in the past, I was this way, but now I am a new creation, I'm a new person. And now, because of God, I don't have to be a statistic, but God has reconciled my past and made me new. So how does this, what does this look like then? Well, one is this, um, open yourself to discussing your past. Open yourself to discussing your past. Who are you going to discuss your past with? Well, one, God Talk to God about it. You know, when you pray, you're not just supposed to ask God for things, but ask, but, but talk to God. Tell him what's going on. Man, use, talk about your past with your leaders. Man, we have some awesome leaders here. Like, like seriously, I always talk about them every single week. Port Jervis, you have amazing leaders. Newburgh, you have amazing leaders. And in small group, we ask you questions that are thought-provoking sometimes, you know? Like, how do you guys have a hard time sometimes answering those questions in the small group? Like, can we be honest? Like, yeah, it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be difficult. Well, use your leaders. Talk about your past with other strong believers in Christ, your friends, your peers who are strong believers. Also, a therapist. For some reason, therapists kind of get a bad rap, but listen, some people, like, it really does work to talk with somebody. Parents, too. Yes, I should add that. In your notes, put that there. Put parents right there. Uh, Number two, let God define who you are and not your past. And thirdly, reflect on blessings more than the curses in life. Think about what God has done in your life and be thankful to him. Amen? Brings it to my next point. A joyful life embraces the present. A joyful life embraces the present. Man, y'all, y'all, are, y'all are young. You guys are teenagers. Man, make, make the most of your life now. Don't wait until you are older. In other words, this. Don't let your focus of the past or your future rob you from the joy God has for you now. So going back to the story of Scrooge, after he is visited by the ghost of Christmas past, he is then visited by the ghost of of Christmas what? Christmas presents. Okay. And he hears what people truly think about him. And he sees people having fun without him. And he sees the joy that people are having without him. You see, Scrooge's life, it was all about staying rich, getting rich, getting stuff and keeping stuff. And, and because of Scrooge's quest for material wealth, 
Scrooge ends up missing on all of the joys that were available to him in the present. What does that have to do with y'all? Is this, I urge you, don't let your desire for money, for material things, for just stuff, to keep you from the joys available to you right now. And it's so easy to see this in little kids. I know I talk about my kids all the time. One, because I love them. Hi, girls. They're probably watching this right now. But my youngest daughter, she would be playing with a toy. She loves her Peppa Pig toys, okay? Like Peppa Pig. You love Peppa Pig too? That's great. Okay. It's a little bit weird, but it's all right, all right? It's okay to not be okay. Anyways, um, so she would be playing with her little Peppa Pig toys, and then my oldest daughter, she'll bust out her Bluey toys, okay? Bluey's legit. Bluey is my favorite even. And I'm an adult, which is weird, okay? And so what happens? My youngest girl, Colby, she was happy with her little Peppa Pig stuff. But then she sees her sister with the Bluey stuff. And all of a sudden, the joy that she was having gets robbed, Bluey is awesome. Yes, it is. And she gets, so she would drop drop that toy, and she would start to, like, cry about the toys she doesn't have. And y'all, even though we're older, how many of y'all can be honest and say, we do that all the time? Where God has given us so much things, so many blessings, and then here comes somebody else, whether in person or on social media, who has something that we don't have and that we super really, that we really, really want. And what does that do? It robs you of the joy of the things that you do have because you're focusing on the things that you don't have. And joy in the present is robbed. I'm reminded of this story about uh, an American businessman and a Mexican fisherman. No, this is not a joke, okay? But uh, it's a really kind of a cool story. But the American businessman... It was at the pier of a small coastal Mexican village when a small boat with just one fisherman docked. Inside the small boat were several large yellow fin tuna. The American complimented the Mexican on the quality of his fish and asked how long it took him to catch. The Mexican replied, oh, only a little while. It didn't take me much time, much time at all. The, Mex- the, the American then asked why he didn't stay out. Why aren't you staying out and why don't you catch more fish? And the Mexican just simply replies, oh, like I, I, I had caught enough fish to support me and, and my family's needs. And then the American then asks, well, well, what do you do with the rest of your time when you're not fishing? And the fisherman replies, oh, I spend the morning with my family I fish a little bit, I come back, I play with my children, I take a siesta with my wife, and then I stroll into the village in e- uh, during the evenings where I sip wine and play guitar with my amigos. I have a full and busy life, sir. The American businessman, he scoffs at this, and he's just like, I have a Harvard business degree, and I could help you. You know what you should do? You should spend more time fishing. And when you catch more fish, you'll get more money, and then you can get a bigger boat, and then you can, get, you can catch more fish and then get an, an even bigger boat. And after you catch more and more fish, you can buy several boats and eventually have a whole fleet to yourself. You would need to leave this coastal village, this little fishing village, and move to Mexico City. And then eventually, you'll have to move to L.A. And eventually, you'll have to move to New York City to to run your, your, your expanding enterprise. And the Mexican fisherman asks this businessman, well, wait a second. How long would this take? And he replies, oh, 15 to 20, maybe even 25 years. And then the Mexican fisherman is just like, okay, well, after those 25 to 30 years, then what? The American laughed and said, that's the best part. When the time is right, you can announce 
an IPO and sell your company and make millions and millions and millions of dollars, and you'll be very rich. And the Mexican fisherman was like, oh, man, that's amazing. But, but once I do that, then what? And then the Americans said, well, then you would retire and move to a small coastal fishing village where you could sleep late, fish a little, play with your kids, take a siesta with your wife, and stroll into the village in the evenings where you could sip wine and play guitar with your amigos. Well, that's kind of silly, isn't it? Trying to build this, this huge enterprise only to retire and do the same thing that you would have been doing in that moment. Now, I'm not sharing this to inspire you guys to be lazy, okay? Like, seriously, go to school, get a job, all right? Uh, who said no? Get, get a job, okay? Get a job. Uh, but I'm not sharing this for you to be lazy, but we live in a culture that is so fixated on stuff. We live in a culture that is so fixated on getting rich and getting more and more things. And we live in a culture that does this all the time. And we miss, we miss the joys that can be ours in our presence. Don't let your drive negate the joy that you can have now in your present. Amen? So what does this look like again? Um, well, one, enjoy the trip, not just the destination. And I know that sounds like something you see on a cat poster. I get it, all right? But it still rings true, man. Enjoy the trip of life, not, not just the destination or where you're going. Number two, embrace the joys on forgiveness and redemption now. Y'all realize, like, if you're in this room and you're serious about this whole Jesus thing, then guess what? You don't have to live a life of regret. Guess what? If you know Jesus now, y'all, like, you're a teenager and you know Jesus, man, walk in that, walk in that gift that Jesus has given you, man. Like, you don't have to wonder, you don't have to make mistakes throughout your whole life and then come to God. You get to come to life now, Amen. And give thanks to God for who and what you have in your life now. Hebrews 13, 5 through 6. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Last point here tonight. How do you live a joyful life? Last thing. A joyful life makes changes for the future. A joyful life makes changes for the future. So going back to the story of Scrooge, he's visited by the ghosts of Christmas past, the ghosts of Christmas present, and then the ghosts of Christmas future, right? And Scrooge, if you watch this movie, he sees his grave, and ultimately where his greed and joylessness would take him. And the cool part about the Scrooge story in the end, he wakes up and he decides to make a change. We learn that the changes he makes, that Scrooge makes, impacts his future and the future of those around him. Y'all, having a joyful life means making some changes. Some big, some small. It's about, it's not in my notes here, but it's this word sanctification. Someone say sanctification. All right. That's going to be our series in January where we'll be learning what sanctification looks like. Okay? Later. All right. So what does it look like to, to make changes in your life? Well, one, be willing. Be willing to make changes in your life. Be willing to make changes in your life. Man, come to CY and learn some things, man. 
And don't just like walk out of here and be like, oh, Beth of Chris was dumb, or whatever, and then just leave here not learning anything. No. You can come here and learn something and then apply it to your life the next day, all right? And also, too, ask God for a teachable spirit. Ask God for a teachable spirit. Wake up every day and ask God, God, what do you want me to know? What do you need me to learn about myself? What adjustments do I need to make to live the best life that I could possibly live for your glory? I love Jeremiah 29, 11. It reminds us about God's real plan for all of us. It says this, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Y'all in this room, every single one of you have a future and have hope. Those of you who are watching this at our campuses or online, Jesus came down from heaven to be born in a manger and to die on a cross to give you a hope and a future, a joy that is not dependent on stuff, a joy that is not dependent on how much money you have, a joy that, that doesn't matter what things are going, doesn't matter what, what's happening in the world around you. It's a joy that sustains you, a joy that never goes away. And that joy is named Jesus. So do me a favor all across this room at our campuses. I want you to just bow your heads and close your eyes with me as the worship team makes your way up. Um, understand this, y'all. Knowing joy, living a life of joy first starts with knowing the joy giver. So if you're in this room or at our campuses, if you don't know Jesus, if you've never accepted him into your heart, man, tonight is a really, really good time to do that. You won't have to wait till Christmas. You won't have to wait till next year. You can make that decision now. And Jesus, listen, he's not going to give you an easy life but he will be able to give you a joyful life. So if that's you in this room, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ in your heart, but you want to tonight, I'm going to lead all of us in a prayer. And even if you're here in this room and you claim to be a Christian, say this with us. So that way those people who are, who are praying this for the first time, they know that there's a church who stands with them. There's a church that is behind them. So all across this place and our campuses, just simply repeat this after me. Say this, dear Lord Jesus, thank you for coming down to earth to be born in a manger and to die on a cross for my sin. God, forgive me. I'm sorry for my past. Be with me in my presence. And God, I trust you with my future. You died for me, so help me live for you. Keeping heads bowed and eyes closed here. You know, I talked a lot about joy, but maybe you're in this room, and if you're really honest... Maybe you're struggling to find joy even in this Christmas season. If that's you, I want you to know that you're not alone. I want you to know that there is a God who wants to give you that joy that you so badly desire. So in this room at our campuses, if you can say, you know what, Pastor Chris, I'm struggling to find joy in my life. I, I need God's help to find joy. Could you just raise your hand with me? all across this place, just, just raise your hand right now. You just need help finding more joy in this. A couple of hands are going up. A couple of hands over here. That's good. Let me pray for, for those people. God, I thank you so much for being a God of joy. God, for being a God who, who listens to us, who wants to be with us, and who wants to help us, Jesus. God, we know that another reason why you came down to earth is so that we can say that 
there is a God who knows what it's like to feel rejected, who knows what it feels like to be alone, who knows what it feels like to perhaps have difficulty finding joy. So God, I pray that we would pursue you, Jesus that we would not look to joy in the earthly things, but, God, that we would look to joy in the heavenly things, Jesus. God, I pray that you would help those who raise their hand, and, God, I pray that you would help those who maybe didn't raise their hand, Jesus. God, may they find a sense of joy even right now in this place, Jesus. Be with us, Father. We love you, and we need you. I'm not going to see people say amen. Amen. God bless y'all.